Welcome, this is Lingual, and I am Bradley. Spider-Man is one of, if not the most, popular Marvel superhero there is. He's been around since the 1960s and has been featured in countless movies and cartoons. But today, I'll be focusing on his history in live action and how he's evolved over the years. When you think of the first time Spider-Man appeared in the live action medium, you might think of this. Or maybe you already know about this one. But actually, the first non-animated appearance of Spider-Man on screen was on The Electric Company, in segments called Spidey Super Stories. And fun fact, Morgan Freeman narrated some of the episodes. Okay, true believers, here he is, your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. The stories involve villains such as the Spoiler and the Prankster, orchestrating petty crimes and schemes. And Spider-Man, played by Danny Segrin, would always foil their dastardly plans. Obviously. A notable aspect of this version of the character was that he never spoke aloud. He only talked through word bubbles that appeared on screen. These segments were campy and fun, and this really was a product of his time. Marvel Comics Group didn't even have anything to do with the production. Spidey was provided to Children's Television Workshop, now known as Sesame Workshop, for free of charge. So let's move on to the next time Spider-Man swung back onto the screen. This incarnation of the Web Slinger started with a made-for-television movie that served as a pilot for the TV series that followed shortly after. With Nicholas Hammond in the tights this time, the show began production when Marvel's publisher and Spider-Man co-creator Stan Lee sold the rights to CBS to make a live-action series. Unfortunately, Stan and the producer of the show, Daniel R. Goodman, reportedly clashed over the direction. And despite the popularity and ratings The Amazing Spider-Man received, many fans criticized the lack of comic supervillains the show contained, as well as how the stories deviated considerably from the original comic books. It lasted only two seasons with 13 episodes overall. And while the second season's ratings continued doing well, it was cancelled in 1979. CBS was afraid of being seen only as a superhero network, as they were already airing many other live-action superhero properties. Besides Spider-Man, Wonder Woman, The Incredible Hulk, Shazam, Isis, Doctor Strange, and Captain America had all been featured on CBS in the late 70s. <laughs> and don't worry, I'll get to making videos on all those characters at some point. So now we're finally getting to Spider-Man's movie career, right? Not quite yet. There's still one more version to talk about, the Japanese one. The show that introduced Leopardon, Spider-Man's trusty giant spaceship turned robot that he used to defeat his enemies. So this happened because Marvel and Toei, a Japanese animation studio, made a deal that allowed the companies to be able to use some of each other's characters. Toei originally planned Spider-Man to be a supporting character of a planned television show about the legendary prince Yamato Takiru. I'm not Japanese. Who was brought to present day by a time warp meeting Spider-Man, who would have been pretty much identical to the classic depiction from the Marvel comics. But Toei decided to make Spider-Man the main character, and made some pretty heavy changes to him in the comic book lore. Despite the differences, Stan Lee and some of the staff at Marvel commended the show's stunt work and practical effects, and how Spider-Man was portrayed physically, his movements being very similar to that of a spider. So the story follows Takuya Yamashiro. He sees a UFO fall to Earth, which turns out to be an alien warship called the Marveler from Planet Spider. After his father gets killed upon also finding the ship, it is discovered that Yamashiro's father was killed by the Iron Cross Army, led by the evil Professor Monster. Yamashiro then meets the ship's occupant, Garia, an extraterrestrial who injects Yamashiro with some of his own blood, giving him spider-like powers. Garia tells him that Professor Monster destroyed his home world of spider, and that he is the last of his species. He wants Yamashiro to carry on his fight and get revenge for what Professor Monster has done, going by the name of the Spider-Man. Oh yeah, and they also made a spin-off film based on the series, but it was pretty much just another 24-minute episode that they released in theaters. As you can tell, they really went their own way with the character and story, completely throwing out anything that had to do with Stanley's original. But I have to say, it is weirdly fun to watch. So maybe check out this bizarre telling of Spider-Man if you're interested, if you can find it. Marvel made the show available for streaming on their site in 2009, but I guess unfortunately they took it down since then. Now let's move on to arguably the most famous and beloved version of Spider-Man in live action. Sam Raimi's Spider-Man, played by Tobey Maguire. Although the movie came out in 2002, a Spider-Man movie has been in development since the mid-70s, when Steve Kranz attempted to launch a full-fledged film, but it didn't get off the ground, and for the next few decades, a number of directors and producers took turns to trying to get a Spidey movie made. This list includes Roger Corman, the director of the first Fantastic Four, Canon Films, who actually put out an ad showing their upcoming film, Toby Hooper, director of Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Poltergeist, who sadly passed away while I was first starting to make this video. 
and of course, the legendary James Cameron, director of Terminator, Aliens, Titanic, and Avatar. And there's so much more depth to the stories of the arduous decades-long task of trying to make a Spider-Man film, but I can't really get on to one video. But eventually, Columbia got the rights to the character and hired Sam Raimi. For me, this film holds a lot of importance. It was actually the first PG-13 movie I'd ever seen. I watched it time and time and again, it was my first real taste into the world of superheroes. Anyway, the movie pitted Spider-Man against the Green Goblin, played by the endlessly talented Willem Dafoe. Bingo. Me. <laughs> but not only was it the first time we saw Spider-Man fight an actual villain from the comics, the audience also was treated to nearly all of Peter Parker's supporting cast. While Jameson and Aunt May appeared in the 1970 series, Uncle Ben, Flash Thompson, Betty Brandt, Harry Osborn, and Mary Jane Watson all get a chance to shine on the big screen at last. And it gave birth to probably the most perfect portrayal of a comic book character ever, J.K. Simmons as J. John Jameson. Sold out? Every copy. Tomorrow morning, Spider-Man, page one with a decent picture this time. Move Conway to page seven. There's a problem with page seven. I make it page eight and give him 10% off. Okay. I make it 5%. That can't be done. Get out of here! Finally showcasing Spider-Man with the budget he deserves, we got to see great action and groundbreaking special effects. While there were several superhero films trying to take the genre in a more mature and serious direction, like X-Men and Blade, this one shows that you can have a serious take on a superhero and still make it bright and fun and optimistic. It was a pioneering film for the comic book movie genre going forward, especially at the box office. If this film proved anything, it was that audiences were ready for another huge superhero franchise, and Spider-Man was happy to oblige. Opening weekend, it made $114 million domestically. It was a record breaker for the time, and it remained the highest opening weekend in the U.S. for a non-sequel movie until 2010's Alice in Wonderland. It brought superpowers and tights back to the blockbuster world, and was the first of currently six films to make up one of the biggest film franchises in history. There was a lot to love with this incredible installment, but it certainly wasn't a fluke. The commercial and critical success continued with Spider-Man 2. Spider-Man returns in his highly anticipated 2004 sequel. Alfred Molina plays the villain, Dr. Octopus, and the plot saw Peter Parker constantly losing his powers due to his personal life being severely strained by his choice of being a superhero. And because of his decision at the end of the first movie to break up with MJ, she ends up with J. Jonah Jameson's astronaut son, John. While this is happening, Peter befriends a nuclear scientist named Otto Octavius, but an accident occurs during a public demonstration of his new technology, which causes his wife's death and his mechanical arms to take control of his mind, manipulating his thoughts and ultimately making him steal and threaten lives and able to complete his experiments. But as mentioned before, Octavius isn't the only obstacle for Peter to overcome. He also has to try to balance his personal life with the vigilante one. So it's very satisfying when he returns from temporary superhero retirement because he is needed to save the girl he loves. Then Mary Jane finds out his identity and supports his decision to continue his career as the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Go get him, Tiger. Now this film didn't quite make as much money as the previous. I mean, it made more money than most other movies on Earth, don't worry, but it made $783 million worldwide as opposed to $821. But what made even more money? Spider-Man 3. Making Spider-Man 3 was a no-brainer for the studio, after the last two were so successful. And at $890 million worldwide, it is the highest grossing of the trilogy, as well as the most successful film in the entire Spider-Man franchise, including the next three installments. Spider-Man 3, the final of the Raimi films, had Tobey Maguire's Peter going up against three new villains. Well, one of the villains was his best friend that began hating him with a fiery passion and keeps trying to kill him, but who doesn't experience that at some point in their lives? Anyway, this is the first time we get to see Venom, one of Spidey's most recently popular villains from the comics, in live action. And Sandman gets added into the plot as well, and there's a big revelation with his character which kind of changed a lot of the canon in the series, but I don't want to get too much into that. A storyline that began in the first Spider-Man finally comes to a head. Harry Osborn, played by James Franco, getting revenge for the death of his father. This is what made him become a villain in the first place, but also what makes him turn around and end up helping Peter, realizing that he was incorrectly putting blame on Spider-Man all along. Now, there was supposed to be a Spider-Man 4, with Raimi and Maguire planned to return, but the whole film was cancelled after Sam Raimi left the project. 
Sony and Raimi had some disagreements, and he didn't think he would be able to make the scheduled release date of May 2011. So in January of 2010, Sony announced that they would be rebooting the series with a younger Peter Parker instead of continuing with Tobey Maguire. Next, we have an appearance of Spider-Man in live action that a lot of you might not even realize existed. But since nobody even knew at the time the movie was released, I'll come back to it, I promise. So then we got The Amazing Spider-Man, with Andrew Garfield filling in the role of Peter Parker. The character is back in high school, has a new love interest, and we even get to see poor Uncle Ben die. Again. And then we get another origin story, which is good because how he got his spider-like powers has been pretty much a mystery since Spider-Man's first appearance. Oh wait. But seriously, I think the film could have gotten away with not telling his origins again. But I do understand if the new writers and director wanted to take a crack at it. I personally think it was just a little confusing. Like, what's, what's the point of all this here? And couldn't anyone get bitten by one of these? In the comics, the spider was dying when he bit Peter, and no one even noticed the spider except him. But here, they're all over the place. Sorry, I'm getting off track. The film's antagonist was Dr. Kurt Connors, a.k.a. The Lizard, played by Rhys Iphens. Rhys Iphens? Rhys Iphens? That guy. He is a scientist with only one arm who studies the regeneration habits of some animals, including lizards. His goal is to help humankind evolve and eliminate their weaknesses by shooting a chemical serum over New York City, turning everyone into lizards. Okay, it may not be the most well thought out plan, but hey, he's a giant lizard, what do you expect? And unfortunately, they decided to forego the whole family aspect of his character. In the comics and some animated shows, he has a wife and son that love him, and it really humanizes him as a character. But the way they did it here, I was, I mean, it was serviceable, I guess. A big difference this series had compared with the first one was that Gwen Stacy becomes Peter's girlfriend instead of Mary Jane Watson. I think it was a smart change, because Gwen is just as famous of a supporting character of Spider-Man as MJ is. Of course, she wasn't with Peter in the comics for as long as Mary Jane was, for certain reasons if you don't want spoilers. Which leads us to the next film, Amazing Spider-Man 2. Andrew Garfield comes back to star in the sequel, which pits him against not only Electro and the Rhino, but yes, the Green Goblin is back in live action. Only slightly worse, and not as well set up this time, in my opinion. But at least the filmmakers brought a famous scene to live action film. Gwen Stacy dies, by the Green Goblin's hand. Wrong Goblin, but I guess you can't do everything right. Her death was a monumental moment in comic history, and I give the film credit for trying to bring that to life. And while it tried to set up a lot of story elements for the future of the franchise, Little did the filmmakers know it would never continue. Sony had announced that they were going to develop The Amazing Spider-Man 3, The Amazing Spider-Man 4, a Sinister Six movie, a Venom movie, a film starring Black Cat, and it was reported that they even had plans for an adaptation of Spider-Man 2099. But when The Amazing Spider-Man 2 didn't receive the best critical response, and Sony was having a lot of their own problems, they made a deal with Marvel Studios. They would have Spidey enter the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the reality which includes Iron Man, Captain America, Guardians of the Galaxy, the Avengers, etc. But that entails the Spider-Man character being rebooted and starting back from the beginning, which means Andrew Garfield was now officially done as Spider-Man. So who would play the new Peter Parker? Who was going to portray the Spider-Man that exists in the most expansive cinematic universe? Well, before we get to that, because I think you all know anyway, I want to mention the first time that we get to see the MCU Peter Parker. It's not Homecoming. It's not Civil War, it's Iron Man 2. What? I know. They recently revealed that Peter Parker actually appears earlier in the universe than we thought. He's this kid. The kid that's wearing an Iron Man mask and tries to stop the drone, before the real Iron Man flies in and takes care of it. Nice work, kid. This little Peter Parker right here is technically the first time we see him in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Which is funny, because Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man came out after Iron Man 2. But of course, Marvel didn't have the rights to the character back then, so having this be Parker was a decision that was pretty recent. Anyway, the latest actor to play Spider-Man is Tom Holland, a complete unknown at the time of the casting. He was hired at the age of 19, making him the youngest actor yet to play the role, and probably the most athletic. Holland made a cinematic debut in 2016's Captain America Civil War, where he only appeared in several scenes, but certainly made an impact. But the next year, he appeared in his own solo film, Spider-Man Homecoming. Michael Keaton, who apparently loves playing flying people, plays Vulture, and is the first time we see this classic Spidey villain in live action. But the most interesting thing about this movie is the collaboration between these two studios. Sony, who still owns the film rights to the character, and Disney slash Marvel, who is working with Sony to help produce and guide the direction of the creative process. This is something that has never really happened before on this scale. Two huge separate movie studios creating a film together like this. Now this story is a little different from the previous films in a lot of ways. 
but a significant distinction is the fact that there is no ultimate love interest. There's Liz Allen, who Peter has a bit of a crush on, but, spoiler alert, they don't end up together at the end, and she is unlikely to be part of the future sequels. And there are some cameos of some of Spidey's supporting cast from the comics, but many of the original major players don't even appear. But the movie got critical acclaim, and is currently the second highest grossing Spider-Man film worldwide ever. So it was obviously a success, and they were already planning a sequel for 2019. But first, Peter Parker is set to appear in Avengers Infinity War, and the next untitled Avengers 4. So buckle up, because I'm going to assume this version of Spider-Man isn't going anywhere soon. And I personally think, that's an amazing thing. Thank you everybody for watching my video, it's the first of this kind that I've attempted, and I would love your feedback. It was pretty long, and I've had a lot of information that I wanted to share with you guys. If you don't mind, you can like and subscribe to help me make more of these in the future, and leave a comment if you have any thoughts on the live-action history of one of the greatest superheroes of all time. Nuff said, and Excelsior. Thank you.